Thank you, Jose. Thank you. And uh, I know there's some of you wanted to ask questions, so thank you very much for allowing us to move on because our time is, is, is flying. At this point, we would like to introduce an um, expert who is going to continue talking about uh, working with our young people. Ben Lanquist. I hope I didn't mess with my last name, but your last name, Ben. It's so good to have you here. Ben is coming to Oregon from Oregon Conference, young adult director of Oregon Conference. And also he leads a growing together cohort for North Pacific Union. He hosts the podcast Rise and Leave, Leave that is followed in 110 countries. Wow. God bless you immensely. Not the because of your voice, obviously, but because you're doing some great work. Thank you, Ben, for being here. We're looking forward to be blessed. And as before we, we go into Growing Young uh, workshop, let's just briefly bow our hats for a prayer. Loving Father, we want to acknowledge you once again. We want to acknowledge this moment because this is very important for us. As Jose led us into this uh, discussion about the young people in our church. Open our hearts. Prepare our hearts. May you lead Ben so he can really bring us closer to understanding what do we need to do. May your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. I feel like I need to learn how to say, hey, anybody hungry? <laughs> this guy. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to share just a couple thoughts, and uh, I'll try to be concise, but give you um, as much value as I can with, uh, with this conversation about growing young. Um, how many of you, uh, just so I can get a feel of the room, how many of you have already heard of the research connected with growing young? You're already familiar with that a little bit. How many of you have never heard of growing young at all? Um, how, many of you, how many of you are excited about growing old? Uh, you just want, you like, you... you you're like, I don't even want to grow young. I just want to grow old. <laughs> that really is my thing. Uh, we're doing a good job at that as a church, but we like to, uh, to look at how do, we, how do we grow young. So um, in tracking with what God has been doing um, in the last, I'd say, three to four years, uh, there has been something that, that I think has been a Holy Spirit-led uh, movement within the Adventist church. Um, it hasn't come without some pushback, as every movement has. But there was a research project that came out in about 2016 called Growing Young. And the research uh, project was pioneered by the Fuller Youth Institute out of Pasadena, California. And so a non-Adventist institute spent millions of dollars to do the research that we don't have to do because somebody else already did it for us. Amen. And when the Fuller Youth Institute was putting together the research for Growing Young, they called the North American Division and they invited the Seventh-day Adventist Church to be part of the Growing Young research. That didn't, that didn't pan out. But I think it goes a long way to say that Fuller reached out to the Seventh-day Adventist Church asking them to participate in this Growing Young research. Um, what we have seen develop in the last few years is that the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I can say this with confidence because we're very good friends with the researchers from this project, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is leading the way with the growing young research ahead of all other denominations around the world. It, it's, it's incredible. And I, I really, um, I credit the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, especially in North America, with an openness to be willing to learn from the best research that is available. To not come from the perspective that we already have this figured out, that it has to have an Adventist stamp on it to be a viable resource for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our leaders in the North American Division, um, past presidents of the NAD, really went to bat to open up doors for us to learn in ways that we have never learned before. So what came out of the last few years as we have benefited into what I believe has become a movement from somebody else spending millions of dollars on research that we then applied to our Seventh-day Adventist context, and we have seen the Holy Spirit do incredible things in the last few years. So I appreciate the question, Jose, that came at the very end about young people. Um, here is the premise of what I'm going to share. Churches that are revitalized and churches that are thriving are intergenerational churches. 
They are churches where all generations are working together. They are an intergenerational family. They are seen where, where generations are complementing each other in the local church. I had a church tell me, well, we don't have any young people in our church. And so I challenged this church. I said, I want you to take a full Sabbath afternoon. And we do this with a lot of growing young churches. I said, I want you to take a Sabbath afternoon and I want you to open up with prayer, pull the table together, and I want you to get out a pen and paper and I want you to spend a few hours writing down the names of every young person who is connected to your church by a parent, grandparent, a kid that was mentored in a community. The pastor hit me up at five o'clock in the afternoon and he said, you were right. And I said, well, whether I was or I wasn't, what was going on? He said, you won't believe it. Our church who had no young people, the list of names, it is 90 names of young people who are already relationally connected to our church that we didn't even have on our radar. The young people are there. Amen. They're there. And the friends of the young people are there. And the co-workers are, of the young people are there. So growing young is really about recognizing we need to do better but it's also recognizing that not every church, including Seventh-day Adventist churches in North America, not every church is dying, amen? There are churches who are thriving intergenerationally. So the study with Growing Young from Fuller really wanted to look at what churches are thriving in North America and why are they thriving and what are they doing? And this is incredible. What they found is, the reasons why they were thriving, it wasn't innovative, and it wasn't new. It was Acts chapter 2 Bible. That's why churches were thriving, that they were living out the principles of Acts chapter 2 with passion and with, with motivation and with resilience. And so what Growing Young really taught us as a big C church is it's not about doing something new but it's about committing to the principles of Scripture and living them out in the modern context of today. Amen? <laughs> Does eating together still work? Okay, we're, we're hopefully going to do that. Okay, <laughs> a little bit. Does eating together still work? It does. Does sharing resources still work? It does. Does supporting each other still work? Does preaching in public ways still work? It does. So let's talk about this a little bit. We took the best research that was available. And I'm going to tell you what God was able to do. We took the best research and applied it to the Seventh-day Adventist context. Amen? That's what we can do as leaders. Leaders can take the best of what exists in the world and use it and leverage it for the benefit of the Seventh-day Adventist church. That's what leaders can do. If great resourcing exists, why wouldn't we use it to edify and build up the Seventh-day Adventist church so the Seventh-day Adventist church can be on the forefront of using this research ahead of all other denominations globally? That's what we did. So th what is this all about? Growing young is a learning journey for culture change to build healthy and thriving, help me out, healthy and thriving Seventh-day Adventist churches for all generations. Because we know when generations come together and they complement each other with their gifts and their abilities and their passions, that there is a revitalization that takes place in the local church. This is a picture of my family uh, from a couple of years ago. Um, I'm there, uh, right there in the middle. My two kids are on, on the very end. Uh, this is uh, my mother and father-in-law's uh, land, they've got about 125 acres outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And so we went to visit, and we loved hanging out for, for the week. This was at a, at a Christmas time. And one thing I noticed is that when we arrived at the door of my wife's parents' house, they knelt down, and they couldn't wait to embrace their grandkids. And there were literally tears that were coming down from, from their grandparents' faces because they live in Tennessee, we live in Oregon. And there was this heart connection. 
Let me tell you what took place during that week. It was an utter mess. And it was chaotic. There were Legos all over the place. There were toys all over the place. There were so many spills at every meal. There were cracked bowls. And let me tell you what it did. It brought life into that home. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When these little kids came in with their mess with their toys, with, with leaving stuff all over the place. There was a revitalization of energy that came into that home. And why was it? Because generations were coming together to be the church. What is the church? The church is the living, breathing expression of Jesus to our world. The church is not a building or an organization. The church is the living, breathing expression of Jesus to our world. And that house was messy. But let me tell you what, it had life. Yes, sir. And when we left a week later, and they knelt down on the doorstep to, so we could go to the airport, there were so many tears. My kids bawled all the way to the airport there in Nashville. I think it's BWI. They bawled and they cried. I, they, they couldn't even speak. <laughs> Generations had come together. And something beautiful had happened. And was it messy? Yes. <laughs> Did it require a little bit of cleanup later? That wasn't, you know, we weren't there for that to happen. <laughs> that was later. Like, how much do we owe you? I don't know. But it was messy, but it was beautiful. If you want to see a church revitalized, we've got to begin to pray, seek the leading of the Holy Spirit, and look for ways to bring generations together. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to say something that may step on some toes a little bit. I think there are senior leaders, not old leaders, senior leaders, okay? Like senior and seasoned, like seasoned salt. There are seasoned leaders who are not fulfilling their purpose by sitting on a church board. They are not fulfilling their, their God-given purpose by sitting on a church board or even by serving as an elder or a deacon. Maybe they are. But if you are somebody who is seasoned and you have life experience, your greatest calling is to come alongside somebody from the younger generation with mentoring and support and guidance and empowerment and affirmation and do for somebody else what somebody has, has done for you. And I have met so many, I have met so many seasoned leaders who I love, and they are not fulfilled on a church board. And they are not fulfilled in an official title position at a church. If you are, that's great. And why is it? Because they're not living out their calling. They're not fulfilling their purpose. You see, if you are a seasoned leader, what are you thinking about more than anything else? You're thinking about legacy. You're thinking about how do I create an impact beyond the, the, the years of life that I have left until Jesus comes? How do you create an impact? How does your ripple effect go on beyond you? You mentor and empower and invest in the younger generation. Amen. I have sat with seasoned leaders in rooms much larger than this. And I have asked them, who is it that poured into your life that allowed you to be where you're at today? Five hours later, we wrap up the conversation. Everybody's talking about that teacher, that pastor, that grandparent, that neighbor. So if we are here because somebody empowered and opened the door for us, how can we not do that for the next generation? How can we not practice empathy, not sympathy? Sympathy says, I feel sorry for what you're going through. Empathy says, I'm going to close my mouth and I'm going to sit on the curb and I'm going to listen to you, not so I can respond with wisdom, but so I can understand what it is like to be in your shoes and to understand what it's like to go through what you are going through. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have been a teenager before? <laughs> okay. If you don't answer yes... I don't know. We need some prayer. Okay? How many of you have been a teenager before? How many of you, still some hands are not going up. How many of you have been a young adult before? Okay. How many of you have been a teenager today in 2021? Okay. 
How many of you have been a college student in 2021? Unless you're in that demographic, nobody has. So we don't know what it's like to be a young person today. Which means we would do well to talk a lot less and listen a whole lot more. Because the complexities, you can talk to uh, Elder Yegley who runs this camp. The complexities of what it's like to be a young person today, we almost can't even understand. They are so intricate and they're, and they're so complicated. So we as a church need to learn. First job of leaders, I love this quote by Max Dupree. First job of leaders is that we have to define reality. We've got to be willing to say, as a Seventh Avenue church, if we are going to grow and if we are going to revitalize, if we are going to become a thriving Seventh Avenue church, where are we at currently? So the first job of leaders is to define reality. Here is the reality. In the Seventh Avenue church, I'm going to go beyond the statistic and give you what I would share with you in the hallway. Okay? In the Seventh Avenue church, we're losing over 70% of our young people. They may say it's 50, but it's more like 70. Within 18 months after high school graduation. So that's our reality, is that we have 70% of our young people who grew up in Pathfinders and youth groups and Crater Roll Savile schools who are choosing within the first 18 months of post-high school life to disengage from a local 7th Avenue community. But the hope is that we're going to do better. And the hope is that their story is not over yet. Amen? But we got to look at what the reality is. We know that today there is no major Christian denomination or tradition that is growing in the U.S. today. There are just traditions that are dying slower than others are dying. But nobody is growing. Uh, we know that currently, uh, this stats from about 2019, we know from 2019 about 16 to 25 percent of those surveyed in the United States, young people, they say they have no religious affiliation. So across the board, 25% of young people nationally are not even considering themselves religious of any kind. So we have a unique opportunity and challenge on our hand. So here's the question. What if that's not the whole story? What if we as a Seventh Adventist church, what if we said today that, that, that we're not just going to accept that reality, we are going to build a better reality? That we are going to make the list of the young people within our community. That we are going to pray over every young person by name. That we are going to do the visits. That we are going to go to the college campuses. That we are going to go to the graduations. That we are going to come alongside the next generation like somebody did for us. And we're going to put them on our shoulders to lift them higher in God's purpose for their life. Amen? So what if that wasn't the case? Churches that are growing young are those that aren't shrinking and aging, but are growing in involving and retaining young people ages 15 to 29, which brings vitality to the entire church. So a growing young church is a church that is not shrinking, but those in that age demographic of 15 to 29, they are attending and growing in number. We're going to talk about this. So how did they get their research? Um, about 260 churches were nominated for the Growing Young Research Project. So they did research on about 260 churches who were thriving. They did about 335 phone interviews uh, with 41 churches. And they also went and did 12 extensive site visits on churches that were thriving. Here's something that's really interesting. The majority of churches were not predominantly white. So the research supports that these principles when applied they will work in any context when it comes to the makeup of that particular church 1300 interviews a lot of research a lot of transcripts and again half the churches were not predominantly white what does it take to reach a young person today okay what does it take 
Uh, does it take Jordans? Does it take trendy lingo? Does it take lights and smoke machines, programs? Um, here's what we found, is that a church who effectively reaches young people, it doesn't matter what size the church is. Somebody say amen. It doesn't matter what, what size the church is. It doesn't matter if it's a rural church or an urban church. It doesn't matter how long the church has been in existence, if it's a church plant or if it has a very long history. And it doesn't even matter what ethnicity the church is. All that to say, any church can become a thriving, intergenerational Seventh-day Adventist church. Amen? And I think that's the hope for us. Here's the myth. If you're going to reach young people, you have to be young and hip. How many of you in this room consider yourselves to be young and hip? <laughs> okay, we got a few people. <laughs> we, got a few, we got a few people. Okay, uh, what the research supports is you don't have to be young and hip, but you do have to care. And you have to care in a way that makes sense to a young person. Not caring in the way that is easy for you and comes most natural to you, but caring in a way that translates I love you and I care about you to that young person. How many of you have read the book, The Five Love Languages? <laughs> you may like words of affirmation because that's what you want to receive, men, ladies, but maybe your spouse likes acts of service. So you giving all the words of affirmation is not going to love with the weight that it would if you would do acts of service because of how your spouse may be wired. So in caring and loving for young people, it's about understanding them enough by practicing empathy so we can love, support, and care in a way that makes sense to them in their world. Amen? Here's what came out real quick. Here's what came out of this research, uh, but I hope you can see it on the screen. What came out of the research was every church of the 260 that were surveyed, they were implementing six strategies that you can find in Acts chapter 2, and these strategies were shared with every church that was thriving across North America. Here are the, the strategies. Again, you can find these in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2. The six strategies that came out of all these churches, keychain leadership was a huge one. What keychain leadership is, it says that seasoned leaders were always opening doors of opportunity and developing young leaders. And so the question is, what keys do you have? Anybody have one of those retractable key? key? Very dangerous if you're hiking to have one of those, you know. But, um, but the idea is, what keys can you use to open doors of opportunity for younger leaders? Here's an opportunity for you, keychain leadership. The next one was practicing empathy today. Again, empathy is sitting on the curb with a young person and listening not so you can respond, but so you can understand what it's like to be a young person today. Third. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, we, we, we could talk about that, you know. Um, so we have keychain leadership, practicing empathy. We also have taking the message of Jesus seriously. And we may think we do that well as a Seventh-day Adventist church. But what this principle and strategy means is that are we creating on-ramps for spiritual conversation with young people? Are we creating safe spaces where young people can talk about the spiritual doubts that they have had in their journey? And that they're experiencing right now. How many of us in this room have had doubts in our spiritual walk? I'm going to say that again. Because some of you are not being honest. Okay? How many of you have had spiritual doubts in your journey? Am I loved? Does God have a plan and purpose for my life? Am I saved? Am I gifted? Am I alone? Is God really with me? So taking the message of Jesus seriously is about creating on-ramps for conversations about Jesus 
with young people. And then we have the fourth one is warm relationships. This is, this is amazing. You'll love this, Jose. In the research, churches, were descri- churches that were thriving were described by young people as feeling like a family. The churches that are the warmest are the churches that have a sense of family. We know your name. You belong here. We're asking you questions beyond Happy Sabbath because we really know what is going on in your life. We know about that assignment you had last Friday. We know about the promotion you got at Dairy Queen. We know about the colleges that you're applying for that you're so desperate to get into. And we are willing to write recommendation letters as a Seventh-day Adventist church. So it's about making a church feel like a family. Fifth one, and this is where most churches, they either move forward around the circle or they may take a detour because this is where the rubber meets the road. Churches that were thriving intergenerationally, they prioritize young people everywhere. And what does that mean? If a young person can be doing that job in your church, they should be doing that job. Somebody say amen. Are we willing to give up positions and titles to save a generation? Are we willing to say, I will step aside and I will mentor you so you can step into this role? Because I already know I'm a son and daughter of the king. I don't need a title to give me worth and value. So if I can step aside to save a generation by giving them opportunity, let me have the courage to do that. Every place that a young person can be serving in your church, they should be serving in your church. Doesn't mean you don't do anything, but leverage your influence for the benefit of future generations. Amen? If you have been doing the same role in your church for 5, 10, 20 years, my question is why? Who are you mentoring? Who are you investing in? Who are you passing the baton to? That will outlive you. It doesn't mean you're giving up your influence, but you can reposition your influence for the benefit of the younger generation. Yes, sir. Amen? Yes, sir. It's not about you not having a role in the Seventh Avenue Church, but it's about you looking at the life experience that you have and making your maximum impact with everything that God has given you. By coming alongside the younger generation who is living in probably one of the most complicated times in the world's history. They need you. They need a listening ear. They need somebody who cares. I had a friend that uh, he rode with a motorcycle group known as the Hells Angels. Anybody ever heard of the Hells Angels? That was pre, pre-JC, Jesus Christ. He spends his time restoring 1930s and 40s knucklehead Harley Davidson motorcycles so he can mentor young men. And if they have a license, when that bike rips to life for the first time, he lets them take the ride. Using the influence that we have to impact younger generations. And finally, and I know Jose and NAD, the Compassion Ministry It is essential. Let us not just be the best church in the community. Let us be the best church for the community. Let let us not assume what our community needs, but let us have empathy where we listen to the real needs of our community and we say, we want to meet your needs. Even if we have a passion in this area, what do you need as a community? And how do we come alongside you? So those are the six strategies that came out of this research that were shared by the 260 churches that were thriving across North America. Let me just give you this little visual, and I I hope this shakes you up a little bit. Possibly in your developmental years, uh, if you can put yourself on this graph, um, many of you probably went to high school in this room. Many of you probably went to college. Many of you uh, probably got a job out of college. Uh, Jose was talking about being a pastor at 19, and then many of you may have gotten married somewhere along that journey, and then you had kids. How many of you, in looking at that graph, you followed something fairly similar to this? Maybe the job and marriage 
I'm going to ask that again. How many of you followed something fairly similar to this? This may have been our experience growing up for us. Here is what it looks like to be a young person today, okay? It's all over the place. It's jobs, and it's college, and it's marrying later, and it's pressure to have careers, and it's carrying the extreme weight of so much student loan debt that every day you're trying to figure out, how do I make it? What am I doing? So we often think we're going to interact with young people because their life was just like our life. But the reality is their life is so different, which means we as a church, Seventh Avenue Church, would do well to listen so much more than giving advice on what worked for us 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Practice empathy with younger generations. I'll come back to this. And it also means that there are, there's kind of a five-year gap between when a young person graduates college and when they actually enter often into um, what, what we would call adulthood. How many of you have heard of a young person move back home after college? <laughs> hey, hey. How, <laughs> how many of you have experienced that personally? Hey. Okay, it's not a knock on anybody's situation or on a young person, but there are different complicated factors that exist today that didn't exist, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So you have all these young people with this complicated story and journey, and they're wrestling over these huge life questions of who am I, where do I belong, and what is my purpose? How many of us have wrestled over those same questions? So if ever there was a time, hear my heart on this, if ever there was a time when younger generations needed you, it is now. And I just want to empower power you with this charge be for today's younger generation what you needed when you were 15 or 25 be that for them and if you think to yourself I didn't have anybody nobody mentored me nobody supported me be for somebody else what you didn't have but what you know you needed but come alongside young people in this growing young research the Fuller Youth Institute kept hearing about a guy named Bill Wallace. And as they went to this church to do one of the 12 site visits, extensive research at these site visits, they kept hearing about Bill Wallace. And the church members were, they kept asking, oh, have you met Bill? Have you met Bill? He is, here's the quote, he is the most effective youth leader you will ever meet. Bill's incredible. They kept hearing about Bill this, Bill that. And so the research team, they had to go find Bill Wallace. Bill Wallace is 78 years old. Every weekend, Bill positions himself as the service is about to start on the steps of the church. And Bill Wallace greets every young person by name. And Bill Wallace knows what's going on in the life of every single young person. It's not just a happy Sabbath. It is so much deeper. He knows their assignments that are due. Okay? He knows who their friends are. But Bill Wallace, he meets them on the steps of the church during weekend service. He shows up at their high school games and their middle school games. And Bill Wallace has been called in this particular church the most influential youth leader in the entire community at 78 years old. Unbelievable. It, it is so true. And I, I get it. It may not, may not apply to your body because, <laughs> you know, we got some aches a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm early 40s. I got a few aches. Um, you probably can't tell because my hair. But anyway, we may got some, a few aches, but when it comes to impact, age is just a number. You can be 28, 38, 48, or you can be 78. Making a kingdom impact in the life of a young person. And uh, I want to tell, tell you one more quick story. I think you're going to love this. It's worth just hanging on for if uh, lunch is just a touch later. Mason grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He's the young man on the right. He grew up in the Camelback Seventh-day Adventist Church in Phoenix, Arizona. 
I was on the pastoral staff there for about 10 years. And uh, he, he grew up in that church when he was about five years old. His dad decided he no longer wanted to be part of his family, so dad left, leaving Mason um, and his younger sister, Lauren, and a single mom. She raised Mason and Lauren up through elementary years into high school. And when Mason was about 15 years of age, he left the Seventh Avenue Church, meaning he stopped going to attendance on the weekends. He disengaged from events. And later in life, I asked Mason, and I hope you let this sink in. I asked Mason, why did you leave the Seventh Day Adventist Church? And somebody was asking about, uh, during Jose's presentation, about youth disengaging. I asked him, why did you leave? He said, I was getting lots of Bible studies, options, and I was getting a lot of sermons. But what I needed was a father figure. He told me I needed somebody to be the sermon in my life. I needed somebody to live the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in my life. I needed somebody to be the father that walked out on me. That's what I needed. So he left, went out in the world, kind of like a pinball machine, and got very beat up in the process. He didn't have any mentors. So about, this is, this is amazing. So about five or so years later, he's in his early 20s. He drives past the Camelback Seventh Avenue Church where he grew up when he was young. He drives, back, he drives past the church. He has these flashback positive memories about Cradle Roll Sabbath School and about Pathfinders. And something inside his spirit says, call the Seventh Avenue Church. So he told me, he said, I tried to call five times. Picked up, dialed, hung up. He hadn't been there about five or six years. He finally got through to the church secretary, who was a pastor, amen, amen, maybe not by title, but she loved on people, and she said, Mason, where have you been? We haven't seen you in so long, and he, Mason just said, I've kind of been out and about, and I, I have a request, are there any mentoring programs or men's groups at the church that I can be a part of? Mason knew what he needed, and, he, and she said, with tears in her eyes, we don't have anything like that. Uh, like, there's no men's programs or official mentoring programs. She prayed with Mason, hung up the phone. God is so good. Let me just tell you, before all our kids were our kids, they are always God's kids. Amen. They're God's kids. So even if we're not connected with our kids, don't think they don't have a father. Somebody say amen. amen. And so five minutes later, this is so good. Five minutes later, Larry, who's on the left, he feels, this is crazy, he feels the call of God um, to call the Camelback Church. So Larry calls the Camelback Church five minutes after Sherry hangs up on the phone with Mason. And Larry says, hey Sherry, Sherry says, I know it's you, he comes every Sabbath. And Larry said, I just got a question. I want to mentor a young man. Is there a young man that is looking for mentorship do you know a young, I'm getting like chill bumps. Do you know a young man who is looking for a guy to invest in him? Sherry about dropped the phone, uh, like you dropped the mic, and she said, you won't believe this. She connected them together. Mason uh, met with Larry, and Larry said, here's how this is going to go down. I'm going to take you out to eat every week for at least a year, and I'm going to pay. Amen. <laughs> Come on. Amen? Like, and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay. So for a year, they went to a very high-end restaurant there in Phoenix. You may have been there. High-end. Taco Bell. And uh, <laughs> true story. They had a booth. They had a, ah! They had a booth, okay? And they would sit, and, and Larry would just listen to Mason. Practice empathy in the flesh. Here's, let me hear your story. And as they begin to build up this relationship, okay, it is relationships that keep people plugged into a church community. That's what keep people plugged in. I've got research back, story after story, from the Adventist Church with the Barna Group, with Fuller, that supports that reality, that it is relationships that keep people plugged into a community. Larry told Mason, if you want to become a man of God, you've got to read the Word of God for yourself. 
and he challenged him to read the Bible cover to cover. Mason did it. Because he'd been meeting with Larry for six months. And he saw the difference that, that God's word had made in Larry's, in Larry's life. He read the Bible cover to cover. After about a year and a half of meeting at Taco Bell, Larry said, we're going we're gonna to stop meeting because it's time for you to go on and, and, meet, and start mentoring other people. So Mason, at about 23, he bought a home. This was in 2008 when the economy, remember 2008? When the economy tanked, he bought a home outside of Phoenix for $180,000 that's now worth like $400,000. Every Friday night, Mason opened up his home to college students. The average attendance on a Friday night, 50. And Mason paid. He fed them all, just doing what Larry had done for him. Mason called me a year and a half ago, and he said, he said, P-Ben, something is going down, and I need your prayer. Lots of prayer. And I said, what's happening? He said, um, I think I found my birth father, and I'm going to fly across the country, and I'm going to show up on his doorstep in Orlando, Florida, and I'm going to try to reconnect with my dad. He flies across the country. His identity is solid. Amen? Like solid. Larry has spoken life into him. He flies across the country. He knows who he is in Jesus. He knows his worth and value. If that door gets slammed on his face, he still knows who he is. Somebody say amen. amen. He doesn't need worth and value from his, his, his earthly father because he already knows his worth and value from his heavenly father. So he comes over, flies across the country. He knocks on the, uh, the door. He waits for a few seconds. The door opens up, and he told me he knew right away that it was his dad. They embraced they hugged, and their, their relationship in that moment was restored. This is not, doesn't happen with every situation like this. We know that. And I said, Mason, what was that like? He said, it was a wild ride. I said, well, what do you mean wild? He said, it was like being on a Jerry Springer show. <laughs> he said, I met my dad, and the same day I found out that I had five other half-brothers and sisters. I said, what did you do? He said, what do you think I did? I met them all in one day. And so he went around and connected, and Mason sent me this photo of the first Father's Day that he spent with his dad. Great story. What unlocked this was an intergenerational relationship where Larry answered the call of God to call the church and invest hear me on this, years of investment into Mason's life so he could understand who God had created and called him to be. Amen. The greatest impact that you're going to make for the kingdom is through relationships that you have with other people. By speaking God's promises and truth into people. By practicing empathy. Amen. By doing life with people it's not a quick fix it's a marathon if you want to live out your calling and your purpose are you willing to dedicate the time to the next generation amen, amen. like somebody probably did for many of you and if nobody did that for you it's time that you do that for somebody else amen let me just finish up by sharing you sharing this with you we took the Growing Young Research out of Fuller, and we launched a Seventh-day Adventist year-long cohort learning journey three years ago. We take churches with the North Pacific Union on a year-long journey of growth, development, strategic planning to help them understand what it looks like to implement the Growing Young strategies in their church in the Seventh-day Adventist context. Uh, Pastor David Yegley has been on our core team for three and a half, four years of investing in this cohort as a coach, as a, as a teacher. And these are some of, the, some of the church members that we have um, journeyed with. I'm excited to share that in the North Pacific Union, over 25% of our Seventh-day Adventist churches have done a year-long journey in the Growing Together cohort. The, the results are all different, okay? A lot of factors, but... 
25% of our churches are making an effort to be a church that can thrive intergenerationally. A few pictures of our church. Uh, you may recognize this picture, uh, Pastor David. Anybody know Terrence? I, I was so sad when Terrence uh, announced he was moving to L.A., but L.A. is going to be blessed. But this was Terrence and his son at a growing young summit he held here in this room, and the photo was taken right up by the dock, you know, right there. Let me just share this with you real quick, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Here's what I've learned. These are a couple lessons on culture change for Seventh Adventist churches from helping to lead over 100 churches through year-long cohort journeys over the last three years. A couple things we've learned. Um, culture change is, it, it takes a lot of intentionality, doesn't it? And it is not an overnight process. It takes resilience. You've got to keep getting up. And you've got to keep implementing strategies and intentionality. It's not overnight, but it can happen. Amen? So a couple lessons that I've learned. Um, if you want to move forward with anything, as far as revitalization, you've got to start with honest assessment. Where are we at? Okay? What I would suggest is start conversations with the different generations in your church and, and start asking questions and feedback. Where are we at? Ask your elementary students, ask your middle school students, your high school students, your young adults, your, your seniors, where do you think we're at? What's going right? What's going wrong? What's missing? What's confusing with our church? What are, what are your dreams for our church? But you've got to start with honest assessment. Second thing we've learned is this, pastoral and core leadership, uh, direct involvement is essential. If the pastor is not bought in 100%, culture change will not happen. I'm going to say that again, okay? Pastors, th this is just what we've seen. 125 churches, same pattern over and over. If the pastor is not bought into change, change will not happen. So senior leadership and core leadership have to be bought into this process. One tip I'll give you about building culture, it starts with you. It's not a strategy. But you have to live the culture that you want to see replicated and duplicated in your church. So it starts with that direct involvement by pastoral and core leaders. Third thing is this. It requires a long-term commitment. You're going to have to be willing to build healthy culture for two to three years and beyond. When we talk to our, our friends at the Fuller Youth Institute, they'll say, that most churches make their biggest breakthroughs in year three. It's not overnight, but you got to commit long term. I had a pastor tell me, like six months in, well, this is not working. <laughs> like, you're six months in, okay? Growing young and so much of what has been talked about that is so high value here, it is not a program. It is a lifestyle, and it's a learning journey for cultural change. It's a process. It's not about a weekend event, but it's about changing the way you do everything within your church. Not doing more, just doing what you do with much greater intentionality. So it requires a long-term commitment. Fourth thing I learned is this, that a laboratory approach is the most successful. And what I mean by that is you are going to have to experiment with what works in your context. I think it's easy for us to hear people share stories which are powerful to God's glory, and we leave thinking, I'm going to do what he or she did. What he or she did was Holy Spirit-led in that particular context. But you have to, you have to seek the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit in your unique context. It's personal. Your church has a unique platform and mission and ministry. So don't, please don't leave here thinking, okay, our first step is carbon copy that model or idea. You can't carbon copy a model without the three-year process and expect to have the results of wrestling with the Lord in the Holy Spirit for years to see those fruits come out of that, out of that, uh, that church. And so you've got to be willing to say, this is going to be a laboratory. 
we're going to try some things. And what we always tell our churches is this, and we have a few churches that have been turning with us. We always say this, experiment in the margins. Somebody say amen. amen. Don't go back and flip your Sabbath morning service upside down. Okay? You're not there yet, and you may not even need to do that. But experiment in the margins and try some things. Look at your church as a laboratory. Um, fifth thing is this. There's only seven, I think. Fifth thing is this. Culture change starts in the mind, shifting habits, and vision for the church. What we've seen is this. If people don't think differently, culture will never change. It's not about just doing a program. It's about you have to change the way people think. That's why we invite people on a journey for a year to two years. Because it takes time to rewire the brain. Amen? Anybody? anybody re You're like, no, my brain is very uh, neuroplastic. Uh, is that the word? But it takes a while to rewire the way people think. And it's about getting people back again to think intentionally like Acts chapter 2. Last thing is this. Um, the success rate is much higher in community. If you're going to go on a culture change journey, you are going to have much better results if you are collaborating with other churches and other pastors. If you are just trying to go it alone, it's going to be a challenge. So maybe you find a few other churches in your conference or in your union that you can meet with on a monthly Zoom call and you could talk about what are you trying what are you learning? What, what has been helping you to continue building a healthy culture within your church? But we need community. Um, Jose, I, I think we have too many leaders doing ministry in isolation. And we have too many churches feeling threatened by other churches. Where we're not even following the biblical mandate of iron sharpens iron. Like, let's work together. Let's learn from each other. And last thing is this, it's a Holy Spirit-led journey, 100%. So there's strategy involved. That's intentionality. But it's about you and your team, like literally on your knees or sitting, depending on how good your knees are. <laughs> but it's, it's about you wrestling with the Holy Spirit with your team, seeking the Holy Spirit's vision and guidance for your particular team. So last thing, uh, where, where do we go from here? This is just one resource that's being shared this weekend, but I want to share with you a couple, couple things you could do with this, because I think it's always a good question. Where does the rubber meet, to, meet the road? It sounds good. What do we do with this, with this resource? Here's four things that I would, I would just put out there for you. If you want to think about uh, a church that could thrive intergenerationally, Read the growing young book yourself. Don't grab it off Amazon and pass it off to somebody else to read. You read it. And if you've read it once, maybe you read it a second time. But read the book. Take a pen out. Circle the things that are impactful for you. Highlight the things on the pages. But don't just take, take this resource and give it to somebody else. Digest it yourself. This is Acts chapter 2. What does God want to say to you through this resource from 260 thriving churches? Next thing you could do, just as an idea, you could launch a book club. Anybody ever been involved in a book club? Here's what, I, here's what I would do. I would make a list of who are your most influential movers and shakers in your local church. I'm getting real practical here. Maybe some of them have title positions and maybe some of them don't. I would make a list of all your movers and shakers and then I would buy them the book, or I would, I would invite them to buy the book. I would give them 30 days to read the book cover to cover, okay? Can we read a book in 30 days, yes, you think? Yes, we can. Read the book cover to cover in 30 days, and then I would dedicate a Sabbath afternoon, uh, where if you can meet in person, and I would go chapter by chapter and have all of your movers and shakers talk about what did God teach you from this chapter? What stuck out? What did you learn? What did you highlight? What did you circle? What notes did you make in the margins? But think about maybe launching a book club with the content. And then ask the question, now that we have sat on this resource, what do we do with this? Where do we start? And maybe you take those six commitments and you ask yourself, 
where, where are we doing really well in the six commitments and where are we not doing well? And based on that assessment, you could have two options. Either you add more fuel to what is already doing well and you take it next level or you start working on one or two things where your church might be the weakest. Maybe you come back and say, we read the book, our neighbors have no idea who we are. If our church shut down, if our Seventh-day Adventist church shut its doors, nobody would even blink an eye because we don't know them and they don't know, uh, know, know us. So maybe you focus on one of those areas. But read the book, launch a book club. You can look at hosting a weekend. I'll just plug him because he's here. Uh, Pastor David Yegley, he's a certified speaker with all of the Growing Young Research. He is brilliant at bridging the Growing Young Research into the Seventh-day Adventist context. And maybe you dedicate a weekend to helping start the conversation about how your church could become a thriving church for all generations. Hopefully, David, that was okay. But you can ch chat with David. Last thing that I would just share with you is this. Um, in January of 2022, we have a brand new cohort launching in January. And so the cohort is going to be a year-long journey where our leaders in the North Pacific Union and the Southwestern Union, supported by NAD, are going to be journeying with Seventh day Adventist churches for a year. And we're going to be talking about the content and strategy in assessment. The cost for the cohort, this is amazing, so good. God is so good. The cost for the entire cohort for a year is $895. Huge value, huge value. And so for, you know, shy of $1,000, your church gets assessment tools, personalized coaching. A coach is assigned to your church. You get to learn within a laboratory community of 50 other Seventh-day Adventist churches around North America. You compare notes, you grow, you pray together. So that might be an option too for your church. There are some churches who have done a cohort a year ago. Things have changed and it's time to do another one because things have changed within their church. I'm going to stop there because I know we're hungry. But Again, I think the resources shared this, this uh, conference have been incredible. I just offer that as one additional option for those of you who really have that passion for intergenerational ministry at your church. Thank you so much.